The following content is brought to you by Chilton Evangelical Church in Manchester, UK. Our location is M21 9FG. Our Sunday services are at 11 a.m. and 6:30 p.m. For more information, visit our website chiltonevangelical.org. Well, I'd invite you to have your Bible open. There, that passage in First Kings, chapter 17, page 200. 99, and we're going to be looking this morning at verses 17 to 24. But let me take you back in time to 1956 and halfway across the world to South America and to the country of Ecuador. And there are five American missionaries. One of them uh, was Jim Elliott. Some of you will know the story. And they are there to bring the gospel to the Auka Indians. The Auka Indians were an unreached tribe. They were untouched by 20th century civilization. And they had a reputation for killing any strangers entering their territory. Now, for almost three years, these missionaries had been in Ecuador. They were planning, they were praying, they were preparing learning something of the language, preparing to go and take the gospel to the Auka Indians. And as 1956 approached, they had spent some time establishing contact with this tribe. They flew over the tribe. They had a small airplane. They would fly over the tribe and drop them gifts in baskets. And they had a loudspeaker. And they would speak through this loudspeaker and share friendly Auka phrases. And then on the 2nd of January, 1956, they landed their plane on a strip of land near the Auka settlement, and they set up camp. And they invited the Auka Indians, they invited them to come to their camp. And after four days, a man and two women appeared out of the jungle. And they, they shared a meal with the missionaries. And despite the language barrier, it was friendly. And they encouraged them to come back, come back and bring more of your tribe. Well, they waited two days. And then on the 8th of January, 1956, two Auka women appeared out of the jungle. And the missionaries, they were excited. And they went to greet these two women. But behind them was a group of Auka warriors armed with spears. And all five of those Christian missionaries were speared to death that day. And for their wives and their families, for their churches, and indeed for Christians around the world, because this was global news at the time, there was obviously great grief and, and great sadness, and there was shock, but also that sense of why. Why has God allowed this? It didn't make sense this doesn't make sense and sometimes things don't make sense the lord wants the gospel to go forth jesus said go therefore and make disciples of all nations and here are the messengers of the gospel being killed it doesn't make sense and i'm sure in your own lives and in your own personal experiences you have faced perplexing situations why why have these things happened? Lord, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand why you could let this happen. And the widow in our passage, she has such a question. She is filled with similar emotions. Why? And it's brought on by the grief and the loss of her son. Verse 18, she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. What have you against me? And there's a, a mixture, isn't there, of, of grief, but then also of anger and bitterness and bewilderment. What have you against me, O man of God? Well, we're going to look then at this part of the story in the life of Elijah under three headings. One the grief of a widow, two, the prayer of a prophet, and three, the joy of a widow. The grief of a widow, the prayer of a prophet, the joy of a widow. So firstly, the grief of the widow. This 
Women's world has fallen apart. She is a widow. Her only family is her son and her son has died. And it was all very sudden. And we have to think completely unexpected. He becomes ill. We're not told the nature of that illness, illness, but it was very severe. And it led to a very rapid death. And this widow's grief then would be very real. But it's seen in the passage as expressed, isn't it, as anger. Her grief turns to anger as she tries to make sense of this death. And I think look for someone to blame. And this death, this loss of life, it does come as a shock. As we read through the events of chapter 17, as we read that passage, you just, you don't expect this. It comes as a shock. Now, there was going to be a loss of life. Loss of life in a severe famine, that isn't, that is not unexpected. There was going to be a loss of life. When we look back at verse 12, the widow, she only has enough for one last meal. And she says to Elijah, well now, I'm getting some sticks, I'm going to build a fire, I'm going to prepare this last food, prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. There is going to be a loss of life. But then Elijah turns up. Elijah shows up the prophet of God. The man of God turns up and he brings the word of God. And he brings, doesn't he, a, a wonderful promise from God for this widow. Verse 14. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And there's a promise then, there's a promise of food for her household during the famine. And the implication is they will live. The conclusion we have to draw is that they're going to survive the famine. The widow, her son and Elijah. And that seems to be the case day after day. They're enjoying the, the miraculous provision of this unending flour and oil and this blessing from God. Verse 15, she and he and her household ate for many days. It was wonderful. The wonderful provision of God, God sustaining them through the famine. So it comes as a complete shock to the widow and to us when this boy suddenly takes ill and dies. What are we to make of it? It doesn't seem to make sense. The Lord had promised to provide for the household and then he allows the son to die. And it's a devastating providence. And this widow, the mother of the boy, she doesn't get it. And her grief, it turns to bitterness and to anger. And she's looking for someone to blame. And she starts by blaming Elijah and perhaps subconsciously blaming God as well. But she starts by blaming Elijah. What have you against me? Why did you come? Why did you have to come? And then she says, I know. You came, didn't you came to expose my sin. And this death is it's a punishment for my sin. And in her despair, she starts blaming herself. And she thinks God is punishing her sins by taking away her son. And she couldn't be further from the truth. She couldn't be further from the truth. There is a son. There is a son who dies for our sins. But not this son. It's the son of God. Isn't it? We praise God for that truth. But here is this widow and she is angry. She is confused and she is grieving. And maybe you're thinking, couldn't God have been kinder? She's just escaped from Baal worship. She's just escaped from all the false religion of her people. She's a new convert. That's what we looked at last time. She believed the promise of God. She's an Old Testament woman of faith. She's a Gentile Old Testament believer. And you can count them on one hand. What's the Lord doing? Couldn't he have waited until she was more mature in the faith? Why? Why crush her at this moment? Why, why bless 
and then take away. And this widow, new in the faith, she meets, doesn't she, the, those mysterious providences of God. And sometimes we're just not able to answer the question, why? Why, Lord? And sometimes God will bring troubles into your life as a believer. And it is, if you're a believer, it is never, it is never as a punishment for sin. It might be a wake-up call if you're a believer, if you've been drifting a bit in the faith, if you've been backsliding, if there's a need to repent and return to God, it might be a wake-up call. Maybe there's a reason that you need to be humbled. There's some pride and you need to be humbled. But I don't believe any of these reasons apply to this widow. It has to be something else. And sometimes things just don't seem to make sense. But there's always a reason for what happens. In John's Gospel, <clears throat> there's the story of a, of a man born blind. And Jesus heals him. And Jesus gives him sight. And that miracle it is linked to Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And the blind man is healed. And he sees both physical light for the first time, but also spiritual light. And at the end, he believes in Jesus and worships him. But the story begins with the disciples asking Jesus, Teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And that was the assumption at the time, and it was a false assumption. It was a false belief that a condition like blindness was a punishment from God for sin. But Jesus answered his disciples, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus answers, so the glory of God would be seen. And I think it's the same here with the death of, of the widow's son. It's so that the works of God might be displayed in him. God loves his children. God loves this widow and he wants her to grow in her newfound faith and to grow even through such a dark situation. And he wants her to experience his greatness and his power in a new way. And as Christians, if you're a Christian, you, a Christian this morning, you're not spared from troubles. You're not immune to distress. And sometimes, like this widow, you will find yourself in a perplexing and a very dark place. We shared with the children, God often brings deliverance in the darkness. God's greatest acts, some of his greatest works took place in the darkness. We thought then we have creation. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light the exodus, the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, it took place at midnight. And in the darkness, it took place in the darkness. Pharaoh rose up in the night, summoned Moses and Aaron and told them to go up, leave, go and worship your God. And in the darkness, God delivered his people. And then the darkest hour was the darkest hour in the history of our world. Is it not when... The Lord Jesus Christ is on the cross and God sent that supernatural darkness over the land. And Jesus there is dying on the cross. He's paying the penalty for the sins of people like you and me. And in a dark place, God was doing his great work of salvation. Boys and girls, if you're following, I, I said I was going to give a, another example. What happened after the death of Jesus He's buried. And then the resurrection. The resurrection took place in the darkness. It was before dawn. The words of John, he writes, while it was still dark. John chapter 20, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. While it was still dark, Jesus conquered death. By rising from the grave, God does some of his greatest work in the darkest of hours. And whether that is a physical darkness, 
However, it's a spiritual darkness of the soul. The light of Christ overcomes the darkness. Remember that when you find yourself in a dark place. Remember that. Our widow, she is in a dark place. She's in a dark place emotionally, spiritually, and she went to Elijah. She comes to Elijah, but really she should have gone to God. She should have gone to the Lord. Perhaps she didn't know how. New in the faith, maybe she doesn't know how to respond to this thing, but Elijah shows her the way. And Elijah shows her and us the way, and that brings us to our second heading, the prayer of a prophet. James, the brother of Jesus, he writes in the New Testament, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Elijah is a guest in this widow's house. He's been living with them for many days. And Elijah, he cannot remain unaffected by this death. I'm sure he has an affection for this boy. This tragedy, it touches him as well. The widow has suggested that it is his very presence that is to blame. So how does Elijah react? How does he react to this trial, to this dark providence? He takes it to the Lord. He gets alone with God. He, he lays out the problem before God. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. You can pray in any and every situation and circumstance. You can pray any time and any place because we have that wonderful privilege as the children of God. We have that access to our Heavenly Father. There was a time when, as a family, we were driving to Cardiff for Christmas. Our boys were, were very little at the time and the car, it broke down. On, on a busy dual carriageway. And there wasn't really a hard shoulder, but we managed to, to get onto the grass verge. And there were cars and lorries thundering past. And we prayed. We prayed there in the car. A simple prayer that the Lord would keep us safe and that help would arrive quickly. We can pray in any situation. What does Elijah do? He says, give me your son. And he takes that boy and he carries him up to his private chamber and he gets alone with God. There are times when we need to be shut up in private with God. Yes, we can pray anywhere, but it is good and necessary to have that special place of prayer. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' direction on how to pray. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. When you're going through difficult times, when bad things happen, God wants you to pray. God wants you praying. God wants you pleading with him. And Elijah shows us the way. He seeks God and he pours out his soul to God. He's going to cry to God. And not only for himself, he's going to intercede. He's going to pray on behalf of the widow we see the nature of Elijah's prayer in verse 20. He cried out. He cried to the Lord. And his prayer then is passionate. His prayer is intense. His prayer is personal. He says, oh Lord, my God. And Elijah pleads with God. And there are two pleas here. And they're not the same. Two pleas. The first one in verse 20. He is expressing the anguish of the widow and he prays from her point of view and it's it's almost an accusation isn't it he doesn't ask God why why have you done this but he does and reverently ask God have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying and he enters into the distress and the anguish of the widow and do you ever pray for people like that do you enter into their distress do you grasp hold of their problems and their difficulties and plead with God on their behalf because that is what Elijah is doing. He is praying for others. You pray for others, you bear their burdens in prayer. Elijah, he takes the burden, he takes the burden physically, 
because he takes the boy physically and carries it up himself. He's bearing her burden in prayer. And then we have this action of Elijah in verse 21. He stretches himself on top of the child three times. We're not told, we're not told why he does that. It's almost like he's, he's acting out, giving his life for the child. I get the sense that he lies on top of him because he wants the life in him to be transferred into the boy. But what we do see is Elijah's persistence in his praying. Not just once, he does that three times. Three times. He means business. He is persistent. He is not going to give this up until his God answers him. And he prays, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. Now, this is, this is a really big prayer. This is a big prayer. This is a real prayer of faith. At this point in history, at this point in the scripture, there is no record of anyone having ever been brought back from the dead. A dead person brought back to life. It's never happened before. So this is, this is a big prayer of faith. This is a big prayer. And I ask myself, do we pray big prayers? You know, as, as a church, do we dare to pray for big things? Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Do we pray big prayers? Elijah's prayer is personal. Elijah's prayer pleads with God. Elijah's prayer is full of faith in the power and the character of God. And Elijah's prayer is answered. Elijah's prayer is answered. And the whole story rests on the words we read in verse 22. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. We have a God who answers us. The Lord, when you pray, God hears. The Lord hears the specific prayers of his people. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And that brings us to our final heading. Then the joy of a widow. Verse 23, and Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Four words. Four wonderful words for that widow. See, your son lives. Elijah, he had taken the dead boy with four words. Give me your son. And he'd taken him, a lifeless body, from her arms. And now he returns the boy, alive and well, to her arms. How she must have embraced her son. How she must have held on to him with all her heart. Can you imagine her joy? Can you imagine her joy, her happiness at this moment? What joy, her son, alive again, back from the dead. Her grief had been expressed in anger. Her joy is expressed in her faith. A faith that has been tested by a faith that has increased. And she is able to say, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Elijah is who he said he was. God is more faithful and more kind and more powerful than she had known before. God can be fully trusted. God keeps his promises even when we don't understand. <coughs> and we have to learn to trust God in all things. We have to learn to trust God. The widow, she learned that lesson. Her eyes were opened further. See See, your son 
lives. <coughs> Elijah wants her to see. He wants her to see the greatness of God. He wants her to see the greatness of God. And he wants you to see the great things he has done. And God wants you to see the great things that he is doing and the great things that he will do because he's promised them. He wants you to see. But, you know, you might never see. You might never see if all your focus is on you and your problems and your troubles, if you're only ever taken up with your woes, and if all you ever think and talk about is how hard your life is to the exclusion of everything else, you'll never see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The widow, she had tasted something of that. You know, that miracle of the flour and the oil she tasted something of the Lord, but now something far greater. A resurrection. Her son raised from the dead. It's the first record in the Bible of the miracle of a resurrection. But it's not the last. It's not the last because this is a sign. This is a pointer that God gives life. And the miracle of the widow's son, it points to the miracle of of God's Son, of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. This Son, he was precious. <clears throat> he was so precious to the widow. She has no husband. She has no other family. The Son was her only hope. This Son is her hope for the future. He is the one who would take care of her, provide for her, protect her, continue the family name, her only hope. And when he died, she lost that hope. But now, now that hope is restored. And there is hope in the raising of a son. And here at the end, there is the title for our sermon, Hope in the Raising of a Son. And your hope and my hope, and our only hope, is in the raising of a son. It's in the raising of the Son of God, in the raising of, the, of Jesus Christ. Is he your hope this morning? Your sin, it condemns you. As sinners, we face the judgment of God and the penalty for that sin, it is death. But for all who go to Jesus in repentance and faith, he has paid the penalty for your sin. When he died on the cross, he paid for your sins and there is no condemnation for those in Christ. No penalty to pay. It has all been paid. And our hope then, at the judgment, is in the work of and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The widow, she thought the death of her son was payment for her sins. But how wrong she was. No, there is only one son. There's only one son, Jesus Christ, who can pay the price for your sins. He is your only hope. You know, the, the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, it was... It was a great blow to his followers at the time. They were scattered, many of them. They thought it was all over. The evening of that first Good Friday and the following day, the woman and the disciples, they are mourning. They are in a dark place. Their hope is lost. It's expressed, isn't it, by that couple on the road to Emmaus. We read over the end of Luke's Gospel. They are, they are described as looking sad, they are full of sadness because Jesus has died. They are forlorn. And they said that we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped. Their hope had gone. And here's the innocent 
and sinless Lord Jesus Christ put to death by wicked and evil men. And the cross of Christ was a dark but necessary thing. It was the part of the plan of salvation. It was all under the control of God. And God is able to take bad things and make them glorious things. And the death of Jesus then is followed by the power and the glory of his resurrection. And God wants you to see what the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ means, what it means to you as a sinner. It is your only hope and salvation. God is able to take bad things and make them glorious things. We started the sermon in Ecuador. We'll end in Ecuador, 1958, two years after the killing of those five missionaries, Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of one of those missionaries, along with the sister of another, they returned to the tribe of the Auka Indians. They'd returned determined to share the gospel, determined to share the love of Christ, even with the killers of a husband and a brother. And all five men who'd used a spear to kill that day, all five came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not just them, many others, many others among the Aukar Indians and that tribe was transformed by the gospel and the love of Christ. If you want to know more about that story, the book is in the church library. God is able to take bad things And make them glorious things. And he wants you to see. And he wants you to say with this widow. Now I know that the word of the Lord is truth. Now I know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is truth. And he wants you to build your life on that truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control, even when our circumstances appear hopeless and challenging. We pray that you would give us the grace and help us to trust in you. And we thank you that you have all power, even power over death itself, and the power to rescue and save sinners through the death and resurrection of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are the God who hears and answers prayer. Help each one here to know saving grace, to trust in Jesus Christ, and to see and to know that your word is truth. Amen.